worth about eight pounds. But I thought I was very rich. And two things I think I knew. One was that God had promised to look after me. And the other was that you should work wherever you can, that you should have no expectation that other Christians should support you. Why should they? So I looked around Hong Kong to see what there was to be done and was really overwhelmed. And I think lots of people are when they come to a place like Hong Kong or India or nowadays London or, or California, if their eyes are open, that is, because once you begin to see needs, they are not ending. All my young life had this uh, longing to know God and actual dread of meeting him. And it wasn't very helped um, by the people who claimed to know him, or Christians, I suppose, because when I came across them, they were miserable. And um, some of them came up and said things like, are you saved? And I didn't know what they were talking about. I was just aware of their, their hats and the fact that they had high tea and we had dinner at home, you know, and I thought, I've, do you mean I've got to be like you? Um, as they said, I'd change if I knew Jesus, but none of it looked very attractive um, till I went to the Royal College Music, um, where I avoided the Christian Union because um, they, they, they were all the organists and um, <laughs> I liked the brass players. And um, so I sort of had a riotous time there. And finally, uh, on my way back from a, a sordid party, I met a couple of school friends on the train who said to one another, um, mercifully not to me, oh, Jackie really needs God. Um, but they were much smarter to me. They said, oh, there's this really good looking curate and we meet every week in, in a friend's house and drink coffee and talk about the Bible. Wouldn't you like to come? And so I went, and uh, I think it was the first time in my life I'd actually met people who looked as if they were enjoying God, and they talked about Jesus if they knew him. It was really there that I became a Christian. In October 1966, she bought the cheapest ticket she could find on a French boat going around the world and prayed to know where to get off. She'd written to a number of missionary societies, but none of them wanted a 22-year-old oboe student. The growing conviction that God wanted her to be a missionary was finally confirmed for her at a Christian gathering in Croydon. Up until that time, the only meetings I'd ever been to was where you talk to God. Everybody's different, perhaps, in the way in which they hear God. I mean, some people hear him very clearly when they read the Bible. All I can say is when this person began to speak, and they hadn't known anything of my search or praying before, and the words came, go, I will lead you with my eye. I just knew that's for me. And so I looked at all these needs and said, well, God, where do I start? Because I could spend a whole life in one street. And uh, at the end of my life, I could just about have begun to love one street. But, um, you know, you walk out of one and into another. So I knew it was important, maybe not to understand the whole thing, but to do my bit. And that turned out to be Wall City. Since 1898, Kowloon Wall City has been a political embarrassment beyond the reach of any legal system. For the last 30 years, it has inspired terror in the population of Hong Kong. The Chinese call it Haknam, which means darkness. Its six and a half acres have been an incubator for a unique concentration of opium and heroin dens, illegal gambling, extortion, prostitution, and violence, under the control of five triad societies. The King Yi, the Sun Yi On, the Dao Choi, the Wu Xing Wu, and the 14K. When the British took possession of Hong Kong Island in 1843, it was a Chinese customs station. And a granite wall with six forts was built round the area to protect the inhabitants from the foreign devils and the opium traffic 
now being conducted by the British from Hong Kong Island. It became a garrison city, and by the treaty leasing the new territories to Britain in 1898, it was to remain part of China. But six years later, smitten by plague, it was deserted except for a few pig farmers. In 1946, refugees from the Chinese Civil War started to build on the site. And in the same year, the British colonial government made brothels illegal. So pimps, prostitutes and drugs dealers found sanctuary amongst the immigrants. Officially, the police could only watch as during the 1960s, refugees from the Chinese Cultural Revolution poured onto the site and the wall city grew until it reached the flight path of aircraft coming into land at Hong Kong's International Airport, only 400 yards away. With the surrounding squatter area, the population grew to an estimated 50 or 60,000 people served only by four standpipes pirated electricity through open wiring, open sewers where enormous rats, cockroaches flourished amongst children, emaciated cats, dogs, pigs and chicken, brothels with blind, mental and child prostitutes, illegal dentists, and doctors with thriving abortion practices. Fortune Cake controlled all the prostitutes and the opium dens, which there were 32 of. Between them, they paid an enormous amount of protection money, something like 100,000 Hong Kong dollars a day, to the police, who weren't supposed to be here, but nevertheless were quite involved in the business. Protection for all shopkeepers, uh, gambling dens, blue film theaters, and so on. The occasionally attempted police raids were intercepted by early warning systems. Sometimes we, we saw the policemen in the design, in the in this, uh, in, the, in, the, in this in, you know in this in this heroin market, like heroin market, you know. I don't know why. Wherever there is a quick buck to be made, the triads are there, because the pickings are rich they fight amongst themselves. They will chop, draw blood, they use beef knives, they use the triangular file, and they go around in groups of, say, 10 or 15 if they want to beat somebody up. That's the way they do it, never one-on-one. -on -one. Always groups on one individual, either from another trial society or somebody who doesn't pay up. They deal in drugs from the beginning to the end, i.e. from the actual importation, the uh, manufacture, and they also deal in the trafficking and in the selling, and a lot of them are drug addicts themselves, of course. The fishermen strap heroin to the bottom of their boats and bring it into Hong Kong waters. Our drugs come from the Golden Triangle, mostly, and they come to Hong Kong either for consumption here or for re-export to Australia or to the United States. 7,500 sampans and fishing junks are based on 236 islands around Hong Kong. 5,500 vessels pass through the harbor every day and 14 million tons of cargo each year. The chief of police says it's like trying to contain an octopus in a string bag. You push one tentacle in and another one pops out. Heroin has been found in plaster busts, hollowed out Bibles, torch batteries, smoked duck, women's underclay. Certainly there's a lot of money involved and therefore there are bound to be some people with a lot of money in Hong Kong who get their money from trial activities. And uh, there is absolutely no doubt that some of that money and some of these people travel to the United States, Canada, Australia, and for sure there is child activity there. It starts in the schools. A group of boys will adopt the name of a triad society and use it to dominate the playground through intimidation and extortion. You want to play here, you join us or you pay. They may then seduce girls to sell them into prostitution.
right at the beginning was the little children that took me around the streets because I taught in a school. And they used to take me a different way, and I used to make them leave me out a different way each time. And nobody minded because I was with the children. And that's how I got to know the drug dens. And gradually to find out that uh, Gogo and B14K were, in fact, controlling the whole place. <laughs> Through uh, lots of little lanes, hardly connected, you'd find your way to the actual door or one of the old gates of the walled city. Um, and then you'd go into real blackness because that's where all the houses are built uh, on top of one another and no light ever got down. The addicts and the uh, people who guarded the dens didn't take that much notice of me um, because they're very keen on children getting an education. Then I began to find out what the people in the streets were doing. And there were old women, and some of them very young, just would sit on orange boxes in doorways like this with needle marks on the back of their hands. And I learned that that's where women inject. Um, and I learned that the older ones were looking after the younger ones, who sometimes 12 or 13 were just sold. Huh? She looked after uh, all the young prostitutes. In fact, that's how she made her living. She was the queen of the street. And they, some of them worked until they were 67 or so. But what she did was to steal one from the street who was mentally deficient. And um, because nobody would miss her, they took her into their brothel, and she's still used up until this day, and nobody knows she's missed, because uh, nobody would bother to look for her. A young triad will befriend a fairly young girl and um, force her to act as a prostitute for the particular group. They run loan sharking businesses and if somebody like a housewife can't, can't pay her debts they will force her into prostitution. And uh, should the girl refuse to do the job properly, she could be beaten up or she could have acid thrown in her face. When they enter the triad society, they go through initiation rites. They swear themselves to secrecy in the brotherhood, loyalty to the brotherhood is everything. And they invoke curses upon themselves um, and their families if they're disloyal. The worst thing you can do is betray your brother. Most of the young street kids joined the tribes very, very young. Some of them began running messages when they were seven or eight and used to carry choppers or knives for gang fights. Or well, later they carried drugs because uh, police were less likely to stop little boys. Later on after that, lots of the young people thought, well, I wonder what all this is about the white powder I'm carrying for my ballot. Um, maybe I'll try some. You could see about a hundred people chasing the dragon. And down the streets, the people actually were sitting, openly smoking, some of them not very conscious. Some of them quite angry. I got my, my foot burnt. Very easy to buy the drug in here because before, uh, like in the market, you know, uh, they, uh, they put any 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 heroin in on the table. Maybe the uh, different kind, you know, a Judah, Fida, fifteen dollars, and uh, we just going going to buy this uh, this drug, you know. It's very easy when before when coming, and we take the drug together. 
all together and you find the people all together in the, in the camping. I thought as Jesus had helped me, I'd try Jesus on them. Trouble is, I couldn't speak any Chinese. So uh, I learned a few words. I learned how to say Jesus loves you. But it didn't work. Um, I went up to them and uh, I tried Yesu Oine in, in my best Cantonese. And they just said, Guan Wo Mie Xia, which means, what does that have to do with me? Why don't you go find someone else? So I, I learned that it was important not to say the words which nobody could understand. I mean, why would anybody understand Jesus loves you? I mean, if they don't know who Jesus is, nobody's ever loved you. So I had to be Jesus to them rather than say the words. And uh, that, of course, would mean things like somebody had no, no money, maybe giving them money or no food, you'd give them yours, or no house, they could sleep in yours. Or if they had no job, it would mean finding them a job or visiting them in prison or walking an extra mile and, and giving your own clothes, in fact, sharing your life because um, that's what Jesus did. And over the years, um, something went in. In fact, it was, I always remember walking out late one night, it was, it was about two in the morning, and passing by a, a noodle stall in the streets and hearing one um, man, he'd obviously just come out of prison because he'd got very short hair, uh, saying to his friend, Poon Siu Zeb, but Sam Sam Yat Sat Gao, Miss Poon, 833179, next time you get arrested, um, call her number. Not if you get arrested, but next time you get arrested, because they were always getting arrested. And about half the time for things they hadn't done, just addicts of their game. And uh, so he said, it doesn't matter what time of day or night you call, she'll come. And, and whether you've done it or not doesn't matter. But one thing you must remember, you must tell the truth, because she's a Christian. And I, I remember dancing out of the city that night because it was... I knew something had gone in, that is, that whatever time of day or night, or whether you've done it or not, he'll come, because Jesus' name is true. She uh, opened one of the shop, like the, the, the size looked very small, but uh, joined for the young people inside the ping pong, and a lot of the something, like singing, and then tell about Jesus for the people, they know that. Apart from no film theater and the gambling dens and the heroin dens, there wasn't even a neutral place where they could be. So it was to be a kind of safe place. Every time we sung hymns or something, they'd go outside and whistle and shout and smoke and wait till I'd done the religious bit and then they'd come back in. And it was actually terrible knowing that Within a few years, many would die, and many more would be in prison. And I didn't know how to reach them. They were terrible to me. I mean, they used my equipment badly, and they used to throw away footballs and steal the roller skates. And uh, it was it was a complete mess. And one day, um, one of the uh, boys, uh, I think he was about 16, I got really angry with him, and I. I said, you know, what do you mean by treating this stuff so badly? And he said, oh, we are poor, underprivileged people here in the walled city in, in Hong Kong. And you've got this nice church who's supporting you. So that's how it should be. And I said, no, there's no nice church. Then I lost all the good lot. And uh, that was probably the best day of the beginning of the work because I was left with all the crumbs. And they knew they couldn't get anything off me. But we were friends, and as well as the people from the youth club, I was beginning to see the, the rows and the roads and the huts full of men who were taking heroin and to, to visit the opium dens. And uh, I was distressed that we didn't have an answer. Um, it didn't seem to be good enough to hand them a piece of paper and say, you know, register at such and such a, a clinic. Um, I was sure that if Jesus were here, he'd heal them. And I began to look at the Bible and I saw that he healed everybody who came to him, everybody. And uh, I thought it'd be wonderful to go down the lanes, you know, lay your hands on 
blind people and see them seeing. I mean, that, that would be a whole lot more fun and real than saying, come to our Sunday service, you know, because they, they, they don't come to your Sunday service. They haven't got shoes and they can't read, you know. So it's, you know, it's not relevant. And I saw that um, Jesus and his disciples had this power and even when Jesus went the disciples went on healing people and Jesus said we were supposed to. Now I remembered that when I left England I knew of a person whom I greatly respected who's um, in the Anglican church who was reputed to speak in tongues um, and he had a very remarkable uh, and, and real ministry so uh, I, I, I thought somehow this might be connected and I read more books and uh, the, the sound of the gift of tongues was great because apparently suddenly you had words which you, you hadn't learnt which enabled you to express all that was in your heart without being confined by the limits of your own expression. If God has anything from his spirit that will help me to be real to people, I don't want to just preach, then I'd like that. So I said, Jesus, that's what I'd like, and I'll decide what to call it later. I met this couple on the edge of the walled city one night, and as soon as I saw them, I just knew they'd got whatever it was. So I went up to this couple's house, and they came to pray for me, and they put their hands on my head, you know. But then they told me to speak in tongues, and I was quite annoyed about that, because I wasn't going to perform, you know. I thought. If God's going to do it, he's going to do it. So I, I kept my mouth firmly shut, and of course nothing happened, except I got hot. Um, and it was very humid, and I stuck to the seat, and I was terribly embarrassed, because they got this plate of oranges, and which was to celebrate, and this plate of flannels for me to cry into. And, um, and all I could think about during that awful time was, oh, God, they're, they're not going to need either plate. And uh, finally, I, I was so embarrassed that I opened my mouth to say help God in English and when I opened my mouth of course he was able to give me a new language which came up quite fluently. From then on she prayed in tongues every day for 15 minutes by the clock and I would say before I began Lord there are all these people dying you want them to have life and I want them to have life please help me now to pray for them with your understanding because when you pray in tongues, you pray according to the Spirit of God, and he knows how to pray for those people better. And the extraordinary thing was that a few weeks after beginning to do this, I found I tell people about Jesus and they believe. And um, at first I thought my language was, had, had improved, and my Chinese had suddenly got good. And then I realized I was saying exactly the same things I'd said before. But this time, I was saying them to the right people. I was saying them to people who were all ready to hear, who immediately understood. This is where we used to find the sewer spiders. <laughs> really, it's because of your hands. I watched her so long. I think her come from maybe policeman. Every night, uh, dozens of um, youngsters used to come in. When I say youngsters, that was anything from 14 up to about 40s, but, but mostly uh, people in their late teens. And a growing number, I found out, um, were addicts, and of course they were all triads. I have a game of people, it's under to me. They in the youth cup fighting. They smashed in the windows broken up the chairs and taken sewage out of the gutters and painted the walls with sewage. And I didn't know why this had happened. She cried all the next day, struggling with the mess and sense of betrayal. Then she says she remembers that in the Bible, it says you should praise God under all circumstances, so with great difficulty, she tried. The next night I stood at the doorway, frightened. I mean, I wasn't frightened of being beaten up, but I, I was frightened of being rejected because I'd spent all this time with these young people. And I knew that it was my friends who'd beaten up the place. So I heard about it from our elder brother, Coco. 
I won't link to them. If you don't believe Jesus, okay, just matter. You coming out, you fighting. Just this, don't make Jackie sad. So this stranger appeared, um, and he sort of lolled against the door. And I said, "Who are you?" And he said, "Gogo uh, sent me." And I said, um, "Well, why?" Because up until that time, I'd never met Gogo. And uh, I just knew he was the head of the 14K. And he said, Gogo says, uh, if anybody touches you or touches this place, we're going to do them. And Jackie heard about that. Why you come to Youth Cup uh, to warning your people? This is not their fault. They will be there uh, because Jesus loved them. I don't mind. I refuse his offer. Because Jesus is looking after us down here, and he said, "Chisi," because um, his rank in the Triad Society was a 426, which meant that he controlled the fights. He was the fight fixer, and he knew it wasn't Jesus controlling the streets. Anyway, that was the beginning of my meeting with him. And every night, he used to stand at the door. Never came in, but he was under orders to watch me. So Jackie asked me, "Do you want to believe Jesus?" I spoke to her. I'm a drug addict. How can I belong to Jesus? When I believe Jesus, I on drug. So I tell I tell you I tell you I belong to Jesus. I'm nine. So, so she say if you believe Jesus Jesus will give you the power. The power can give you the healing. You can get off the drug. So I think when it when it a medical. So I, I will want to try. I said if Jesus can healing me, no medicine. They have power. So why not? I spoke to her. I tried many times myself. I get off drug. After one week, after one month, after one year, I will take a drug again. So she said, this Jesus, different. She give you a long life. Change your life. New one. So, okay, I will try, I said. He went straight into to that little room there, and uh, he started singing his head off. It, it was an awful noise, because he can't sing, but he'd heard songs through the door. And then he began to pray, and he'd never heard anyone pray before. Um, and then he began to pray in tongues, which I hadn't told him about. And what happened was that this lasted for about half an hour, and during that half an hour, he actually came off opium. Thank you, Jesus. Changed my life. And give me a have job. I still uh, keep to Jesus this night. Thank you. This even affected the boss of the Wall City, whose name was Gokko, which means Big Brother of Big Brothers. And he'd send someone else down to watch me. And then he uh, became a Christian too, so he sent someone else down. This went on for some time.
time I was trying to meet Gogo, but he wouldn't accept my invitations to tea until one day I, I waited for him outside an opium den. I waited for hours because, I mean, he could be fed shots all, all day long. He didn't have to pay. Finally, he staggered out. We went off and had Horlicks together. And um, he started being very nice to me. And I said, um, well, I, you know, I wish you wouldn't be so nice to me because you and I are enemies. I said, I'm, I'm actually dedicated to uh, taking your brothers um, away from you so they can start a new life in Jesus. And he said, um, well, we've watched you. And uh, we've, we've, we've watched many people here um, in Hong Kong. And he said, we're not very impressed with whether they offer us noodles or hymn singing. <laughs> what we really want to know is if, if they're anything to do with us. And he said, when you'd been here four years, we thought maybe you meant what you said. And he said, um, I've tried with my way to get people off drugs. He meant with force. And he said, I can't. And he said, I see you use the heart. So um, he said, I tell you what, I'll give you... Um, my brothers and uh, you can have them for Jesus and I said no thanks because I, I knew he wanted Jesus just to get them off drugs um, and then he wanted them back because they make very bad fighters when they're on drugs so I said you can't have them back if they come to Jesus um, because they can't follow two masters and he said I tell you what um, I'll give you all the rotten ones and I said, well, that's good, because Jesus came for the rotten ones. And uh, so from, from that day onwards, he freed any of his brothers um, from the triads who wanted to become Christians. But he said, they better do it good. I don't want them back afterwards. And uh, about, oh, 13 or 14 years after that happened, um, he himself became a Christian. 我肯定知道有幾個弟兄試過,跟住耶穌一排啊。We've had lots of different kinds of meetings since the beginning in the World City. Two or three of us sitting together and praying and then more and more people coming, but always very informal and always relevant to the needs of the people. 因為我們知道這個世界的困難是真實的,佢今晚講給我們聽,佢有地方預備咗給我們的,沒有死亡。if somebody been bashed up, we prayed for them to get well then the brothers were given gifts of healing and they learned how to pray for one another. He looked like a, a real thug. He'd been on drugs for years and years and had never done a legal job. He lived off crime, lived off women. His turnaround was very, very quick. He was so easily encouraged. He thought he was registering for a center and he got his heart changed. <laughs>
Winston, the first Wall City boy, withdrew from drugs in 1972. Thousands more have come through withdrawal with no pain through nothing but prayer. After a period of rehabilitation with Jackie's organization, known as St. Stephen's Society, they've come back into the life of Hong Kong with a remarkable new commitment to serve the poor, the homeless and other addicts with perhaps a unique perception of what it is to have to live like that. Before I try many times, I, I get off the job in another center. Uh, so I, I have the experience. Uh, when I take off the job, must be we use the medicine or, or the uh, medicine. But Jackie said nothing, only pray, so I am pleased. First time they pray for me, they speak in tongue. I'm laughing, you know, because, because I, I, don't, I don't understand how they speak. I'm laughing. And then they very serious talk to me. Look, when you want to receive, the Holy Spirit you can have. In the way that I'd received power from the Holy Spirit, the same thing could happen to the brothers. So we would pray with them, and they would all receive the gift of a new language to pray in, which they didn't think was peculiar. They think it's rather logical that God would give you words to help you talk to him. My body is so painful, uncomfortable, sometimes cold, sometimes hot, you know, very, very sickness. And then the boys and the helper, they pray for me. In the first time, nothing. You know, in this time, I have no choice. I don't want to go out because when I'm going out, I know I'm working in an old way. I don't want to do. I want to change. I want to be good. So I say, okay, I pray. I, I think I, in my heart say I only pray free will because in the, in the Chinese it's very silent to pray and then I pray Jesus I accept you I confess my sin ask you forgive but right now I just one thing to ask you healing my body stop the pain I said very quick say amen and in wonderful time very wonderful just the pain all gone very very peaceful very very quiet increasingly as as uh, new addicts came in when they were being prayed with to come to know jesus and to to receive the power of the holy spirit i didn't actually um touch them or go near them i left the other brothers to do that when you get off the truck you're not just one day one time you have the pain for uncomfortable maybe one day 10 times or 20 more times you feel pain feel uncomfortable feel sickness you know in this time start i every time when i pain for when i'm uncomfortable i ask the brothers pray for me every time when i pray pain uncomfortable gone Luke was 37 when he first met Jackie in 1984. He had served 17 prison sentences for robbery and other drugs-related crimes. Now he lives in a tiny flat with his father, his two sons, his baby daughter Rachel and his wife, Afong. She was amazing. She even wrote him a note on the second day saying, I love you and I miss you. And wives here just don't do that when their husbands have been to drug centers 20 times. Having been shown love by somebody who had no reason to go on loving him helped him to understand the love of God, which is much harder for some other people to understand when they've had no human example. But she still hoped. And I think that's why he understood very quickly about a loving God and one who would always love you and come back again and again. Hi, 
it came to be that he was in charge of family visiting because we visit the parents and the children or wives of all the people who are in our houses, also those who are planning to come in because we want to help the whole family. <laughs> he used to say, I've got the most special job in the whole church because I can see all the places in Hong Kong where there are people coming to believe in Jesus and that's the real church because that's where it's going to be in the future. This man called Wu Wei. He cannot see fine. He still chewing gum on the street. But right now he at the house because he fall down, broken the leg, so he cannot walk very well. So he not good to sell chewing gum. Luke has found him a home temporarily, while the owner is away. We know him over two years. He already accept Jesus and speak in tongue. The old men, they thinking maybe they have their very beautiful word and then they can pray. But now I tell him no. Very simple, just like the talking with your father. He's a very, very, very good man. And he's very lovely. But he is very, very happy in in heart when he accepts Jesus. The definition of a Christian for Jackie and the brothers is very clear. One who, who knows um, and has been touched by the love of, of God shown through Jesus understanding um, that he gave up his life um, and having been touched is impelled to show that love in practical and in and in spiritual and miraculous ways to other others and I'd say if people don't show it in a practical way to, to the poor and those around they've never been touched by the love and I, I would say those that rule out the, uh, the idea of miraculous intervention may never have understood that a dead Christ was raised to life miraculously. Now he's doing more and more with street sleepers and again he can see several jumps ahead. The ideal is not that they stay on the streets, but that we have a place for them if they're sick or a place for them temporarily until we find other accommodation. First time I come, I get friendship with them. I just give the rice box and ask them maybe they need clothes and blanket. I can help. But not easy, you know, in first time, after half a year, they talk more and more because they know every week we come. Sometimes, you know, they ask me, why you give love? Why you concern me? Huh? No people want to take care of me. No, no people want to talk to me. Why? I said, as all is Christian, we love you because Jesus loved us. Now he's one of the leaders of St. Stephen's work amongst people on the streets. They find homes for as many as they can. Some, for example, go to the Sisters of Charity, Mother Teresa's nuns. Others go to the Salvation Army. They take them home, bath and clothe them, and continue warm friendships with them in their new lives. You know, because, you know, you must spend long times and then they trust in you, and then you can bring into to their house. But we keep the time going, just a minute. Winging and cold and wind can be, we still going. Luke has known Yan Xiu Lin for two years. 
and has found four homes for her, all of which she has refused at the last moment. Most recently, she nearly accepted, but mistaking his blue van for Hong Kong police transport, furiously refused to get in. Later, we coming back again, because in last time we, we asked him, he, he said, she said she liked the inca and vegetable. But this time she, she said she liked noodle, but we only have the rice, so later we coming back again.